What's up, everybody? We're back. It feels like it's been a while. I know I did one of these on Friday, but I don't think I did one Thursday. So one live in the last like five days just doesn't feel like enough lives. And I'm sure you can all agree, but it's good to be back. It's good to be here. And today's topic is interesting. I did not think I was going to go down this road again after the last time we discussed this case, this judge, this courtroom, these lawyers, but so many of you reached out asking for me to break down and discuss what's happening now in the aftermath. Does this matter? Um, how will it affect things in the future? A lot of you came out in support of this judge, which is cool. We're going to talk about kind of her resume a little bit and her bio and why I really like her resume and her bio. And um, she's probably a great lawyer. Uh, it's how she became judge, how she got this case, things like that. We'll talk about what it is, though, because it does come into play and just kind of shaping this whole scenario and situation. So some of you may ask, why do this? Why do this episode? Why do this live? Well, some things are happening, and I think it's important for us to understand in light of Tom Girardi, in light of the California Bar Association admitting that they handled or mishandled 200 plus complaints that went to the California Bar for his wrongdoing and literally made it possible for him to screw so many clients and steal millions and millions and millions of dollars from those clients. So I thought we would talk a little bit about how that process works. When a judge or a lawyer, when they do something that is unethical or wrong or against the rules that we have, what happens, how does it work, and how does that start? And what really spurned this into a discussion was the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers wrote a letter to the chief judge of the 17th circuit, which is where judge Shearer is a judge. And uh, I'm having some connectivity issues. So I may swap internet here. So the Florida association of criminal defense lawyers writes this letter to the chief judge. And we're going to talk about what's in that letter. We're going to read that letter together. We're going to watch some of the conduct that made the lawyers write this letter. We're going to talk about what the FACDL is or FACTL is, which is the organization whose president wrote this letter. Um, we're going to talk about all that and more, but we're also going to talk about the defense lawyers. And we're going to talk about specifically the defense lawyer that shot the bird in the courtroom, making jokes with, with Nicholas Cruz and what's happening to her and how that process works and how you can grieve lawyers with the Florida bar specifically. So hit the like button if you ask for this content or if you like this content. Subscribe to our page if you haven't already because we do have our favorite special guest here who is a former president of the FACDL, the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I think he was one of the founding members of it, multiple award winning, speaks at all their conferences, is about as in line with the FACDL as you can be. Um, but... He's also been part of the Florida Bar Grievance Committee, and he understands what it's like for um, lawyers to get grieved and what you do through that process. And, and one of the things we're going to be talking about is the fact that Judge Shearer was a subordinate or worked for or learned from one of the prosecutors on this case and how that works and if that's common. And we're going to talk about all those processes and more and answer a ton of your questions today. But the special guest is my dad. Big George on here. I've unmuted you. Thanks for joining us, dad. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So as we get into this process and what's kind of happening um, with this judge, Judge Shear. So it's the penalty phase trial, Parkland shooter, death penalty case. He gets life, not the death penalty. And some stuff happened in the courtroom with the public defender, assistant public defender, prosecutors, judge, all of the above. And the president of the FACDL writes a letter. So can you tell us first, what is the FACDL? What is the purpose of it? Why did it form? 
Well, the FVCDL formed about 25 years ago. And a, a bunch of us got together and said there needed to be a nation, I mean, a statewide organization for criminal defense lawyers so that we're not sitting alone in the courtroom, that we have help, we have support. Uh, all these other groups, like the state attorneys have an association, uh, the judges have an association, but the criminal defense lawyers didn't. So they formed FACDL for that purpose, to support the effective, ethical, and proper handling of the criminal defense function in the state court system. So that's what they do. They, they defend criminal defense lawyers when they have problems uh, with judges. Uh, they legislate, they go up and they lobby up in the legislature for uh, various laws. They lobby the Supreme Court for various rules. So they just try to make the criminal defense function and the criminal defense and criminal justice function in the whole state operate better. That's their purpose. And they also educate lawyers and judges yes. in the criminal field, right? Like lawyers yes. and judges, they come to these conferences, they speak at these conferences, they learn from each other. And Audra's in the chat as well. You yeah. saw her at the last FACDL meeting. So, you know, it, it's a... It's an association like any other association, right? A lot of you guys are professionals in here, whether it's an accountant, psychologist, whatever it may be. So it's an association of criminal defense lawyers. They fight for the right. rights of criminal defense lawyers. Um, and there are, const there are constitutionally protected subjects in the courtroom, which I think is really important. Um, and you're a former president and the current president wrote this letter. And let's get to this letter together here so we can just show the words on the screen, explain what it's talking about, explain why potentially it was written. All right. Can you see that? Well, I have a copy of it in front of me. Okay. So this is page two. I mean, sorry, this is page one here. So dear Ju right. judge Tudor. So why write it to the chief judge of the 17th circuit? That one, I've got to be honest with you. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, it's, it's appropriate to write to the chief judge for some reasons to, to alert the chief judge what's going on in the courtroom. But the chief judge really can't do much. Uh, the chief judge is a circuit judge. Uh, judge here is a circuit judge. They are of equal rank in the court system. Uh, but the, the chief, chief judge, judge, can't they move Shearer to civil court potentially next time yes. around? The chief judge does have some control over which judges are in which uh, practice areas or jurisdictions and things like that. Well, there's even been some complaints that the chief judge should have stepped in when Shearer was assigned to this trial because this is the first death penalty case that she's ever had. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is not the place to start. You should bring some experienced uh, judge in here. And uh, so there's a, been some complaints that there should have been somebody stepping in in the very beginning with an experienced judge rather than put a kind of a newbie judge in there to handle probably one of the biggest uh, death penalty cases and turn out to be not, but a death penalty case that you could see. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so let's again, get to what... Going back, just to what your question. They can move, move them around, but they really can't punish them. They really sure. can't remove them from office. That's another group that can do that. Right. Um, and if we look here under past presidents, we see somebody we recognize here, George Tragos. All right. The Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers is troubled and feels obligated as representatives of the criminal defense bar to express dismay at the behavior of Honorable Elizabeth Shearer. This letter addresses events which took place during sentencing proceedings for Nicholas Cruz on Tuesday, November 1st, 2022. Judge Shearer's hostile and demeaning treatment of defense counsel, one of whom is the elected public defender, exposed seemingly deep disdain for the role defense lawyers play in the criminal justice system. We also take the position that Judge Shearer's hostility reveal, reveals a temperament ill-suited to the criminal bench. Judge Shearer's comments and actions were not only offensive, but were also ultimately detrimental to the integrity of the judiciary and the judicial system. Do you want to talk real quick about the elected public defender and why that may even just be a little different than you or I stepping up there? Well, first off, the elected public defender is a constitutional officer. They're in the Constitution of Florida, just like the state attorney just like the sheriff, just like the governor. So they're, they're not just some person just hired to do a job. They're elected through the entire circuit and they are a constitutional officer and they deserve that respect. They're, they're an, a key part of the, actually they're part of the executive branch because the, they're not a judge, but they're a key part 
of what's going on and, and what happens in this state. So they deserve some respect and, and he got no respect. We urge you to address this with Judge Shear and take all appropriate steps to ensure she is not in a position to prejudice any other criminal cases. That's what I'm saying. I think they're asking for her to be moved into family law or probate or civil or something like that. Uh, surely you have seen the exchange between Judge Shear and elected public defender Gordon Weeks and his assistants. When Mr. Weeks rose to address comments by victims' families made earlier in the day, Judge Shearer dismissed him. In fact, when he asked to be heard further, the court admitted she, summar she was summarily dismissing him. Judge Shearer's comments were directed to an elected constitutional officer whose demeanor was respectful and calm. Mr. Weeks deserved better. I think this is a good spot to pause and say, especially me, okay? Like, I am a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer. My dad as well does plaintiff's personal injury work. My dad does a lot of criminal defense work. We, in this situation, 100% support the victims. This is an admitted killer who pled guilty, who admitted to doing these heinous acts. Monster, I think, is an appropriate term for him. The fact that the victims said whatever they wanted to say about Nicholas Cruz in the media, in the courtroom, is 100% within their purview. We are not saying anything that the victims should have or could have done differently. This is specifically, and this letter is specifically addressed to the judge and how she handled herself in applying the rules of the courtroom and just dealing with a complaint from the elected public defender. A lot of people saying they like the judge, perfectly fine. I like the judge too. I just didn't like some of the stuff that she did. Christine Covey says, ridiculous complaint, boo to me. She yelled at me. You can't do that, though. You cannot demean the elected public defender in a criminal case during sentencing. At sidebar, certain things are said, and it's a little bit different, right? It's not out there in the open for everybody to watch and hear in the gallery. The rules have to be in place, and you'll see why as we kind of read through what the rules are like in Florida in order to keep an unbiased courtroom. Because right now, we all kind of stand in unison against Nicholas Cruz. And it's all well and good as long as we're on the same page against a criminal defendant. But if we see a case that the criminal defendant might be not guilty, they might even be innocent. We think they're wrongfully charged. That has happened on this channel. We've discussed cases where people have talked about prosecutorial misconduct and asked me about cases. How can this happen? How can this go forward? So we have to remember all of that in context that this same judge is going to be in front of cases like that too. Uh, Mo just asked, what is summarily dismissing somebody? Well, I mean, I mean, she could use whatever word she wanted. What she's telling them is just sit down and shut up. Exactly. And, and she just, she just wanted to use those words. He actually used those words. Actually did. Yeah. Yeah. Are you summarily dismissing me? And she could, yeah. but he actually said, please don't up. summarily dismiss right. me. I think like he was being very respectful. And oh, calm. he was, you know, he did an excellent job of being respectful. Yeah. He was I agree. Not respectful in any way. Um, okay. Judge Shearer told both Mr. Weeks and chief assistant public defender, David Wheeler to go sit down. She said this in the course of misrepresenting the arguments each had made. The image of a judge relegating an elected public defender and his top assistant to sit in the corner like misbehaving children is offensive and discounts their very vital and difficult role in the system. The irony of Judge Shearer's approach is that she became rude and animated in response to a straw man which she herself had established. The attorneys objected to what they perceived as threats to them and their families. And this language, I think, is actually really good. He's not saying they actually were threatened, right? Right. We talked about on the other video that threats would be wrong, but nobody actually said they actually threatened the criminal defense lawyers. It was more of, you know, karma is going to get you and your children and things like that, which at, at the very least towed the line of inappropriate comments. If the judge wanted to calm them down, fine. If the defense lawyers wanted to ask them to be tapered down, fine. The judge can say no, but the way that the judge acted toward the defense attorneys is really what this letter is focusing on. Well, I, I, I kind of I kind of disagree because I, I do think, and again, I don't know if I'm using the word threat, but I do think that when you make your comments, commenting about those people that do the criminal defense function in the courtroom as opposed to the defendant and not separating the lawyer from the defendant is wrong. And they didn't do that. They they found that they were almost in a conspiracy with the defendant. And those are the statements, because I, I heard some of the statements, and those are the things they said. And I think it's wrong 
to attack the criminal defense lawyer in any way because of what their client did. And, and, that's, and that, to me, was the, what the, the vital problem, what really happened here and what was wrong. So I disagree. And I think that they're absolutely allowed to say if they think that an argument was completely bogus and blaming mental health when it wasn't, I think that's all fair game. Arguments made in trial by the criminal defense lawyers. I think personally attacking them and their children, agreed. You should not personally attack the criminal defense lawyers or their children. But I think it's a-okay to attack the arguments they made as hogwash or say those arguments are hogwash. Um, and the defense attorneys in this case did all sorts of things that I think were line crossing or close to line crossing and frustrating. And I think it's under understandable if they were going to argue about some of the tactics taken in trial, not saying that the criminal defense lawyers deserve what Nicholas Cruz deserves or acting like the criminal defense lawyers were Nicholas Cruz, things like that. Um, that, that I agree with personally attacking them. I agree with, but I think it's fair game to attack how they argued at trial, especially if you think that they used stuff like mental health inappropriately, um, to try to get him off. So some, some nuance there. Um, okay. They politely and plainly asked the court to prevent further victim impact testimony, which included thinly veiled threats towards counsel. These thinly veiled threats were coming from the lectern in Judge Shear's courtroom. She was physically present and acknowledged the inappropriate comments. Judge Shear suggested the thinly veiled threats simply be ignored. When Mr. Wheeler suggested that Judge Shear would view the comments differently, were they about her and her family? She turned that on turned that on its head and said the lawyer was threatening her children. We broke this down in detail in the last video. That's exactly what she did. Mr. Wheeler never did any such thing. All this occurred, not incidentally, after Mr. Weeks had asked to address the issue at sidebar rather than in full public view. And I actually think that may have been her biggest mistake, not just handling them at sidebar. Nobody would have heard any of this. We would have gone back down. She didn't summarily dismiss them. And that would have been the more appropriate way to handle it, in my opinion. The court refused that invitation before inflaming the rhetoric rather than maintaining Mr. Weeks' civil and measured tone. Canon 1 of the Florida Code of Judicial Conduct declares that an independent and honorable judiciary is indispensable to justice in our society. A judge should participate in establishing, maintaining, and enforcing high standards of conduct and shall personally observe those standards so that the integrity and independence of the judiciary may be preserved. Judge Shearer did not uphold the edict of Canon 1, and her behavior undermines public confidence in the integrity and independence of all judges. The Parkland sentencing was a dramatic and painful yet critical exhibition of our criminal justice system. Defense attorneys vigorously represented their client knowing how reprehensible his actions were and how appalling most people found him. To stand by those who all else would readily condemn is, to condemn is the test of not just a great defense lawyer, but also the Constitution itself. Defense counsel provided a critical function of our system necessary to maintain its integrity. The court had an obligation to treat all litigants and counsel with dignity, uh, their roles and humanity deserved. Judge Shearer failed in that obligation and such failures by judges undermine in the public eye the entire criminal justice system. So again, this is somebody that represents the criminal defense bar in Florida, the FACDL, and he wanted to bring it to the attention of the chief judge. And potentially, if this happens in the future in front of this judge, you better believe that this will be referenced. And he references Canon 1, which I'm going to put up on the screen next, from the Supreme Court of Florida, a judge shall uphold the integrity and independence of the judiciary. An independent and honorable judiciary is indispensable to justice in our society. A judge should participate in establishing, maintaining, and enforcing high standards of conduct and shall personally observe those standards so that the integrity and independence of the judici judiciary may be preserved. And then if we get to the commentary, deference to the judgments and rulings of courts depend upon public confidence in the integrity and independence of judges. We just sat through a, a Daryl Brooks trial where he tried to undermine the court left, right, and center and say she didn't have subject matter jurisdiction, saying he didn't have to listen to her, saying it wasn't lawful law. We don't want to give any 
credence to those arguments, right? But when stuff like this happens and criminal defendants start saying the whole judicial system is stacked against them with the state attorneys and the judges on the same team fighting against the criminal defense lawyers and the accused who are presumed innocent in our system, that's where it becomes a problem, right? I mean, that's really where it becomes a problem. We don't want that to be true. And we're going to look at her bio and how she was a former state attorney for 10 or 11 years prior to becoming a judge. So if somebody wants to really put this together and say, former state attorney worked with these state attorneys, she is not unbiased. But, but before anybody thinks I'm saying that, you were a former state attorney. I worked at the state attorney's office. You were a former chief assistant U.S. attorney, federal prosecutor, right? Yes, and so, I've, I mean, appeared, I've appeared before judge after judge uh, of assistant U.S. attorneys and state attorneys that I supervise. Right, and so I, that's what I'm saying. Like The fact that this judge is a former state attorney does not make her biased. Tons of criminal defense lawyers and judges were, in fact, state attorneys. We'll come back to this commentary, but I just I want to look at her bio real quick and let's let's hit what you were just talking about. Where I mean, you the the funny story that I tell people all the time is you were in a trial, small county here in Florida, and the judge told the prosecutor that he used to work for you and you used to be a supervisor. And if he wanted him to recuse himself, that he would, but the only other judge in that circuit was also a subordinate of yours at the U.S. Attorney's Office, so you were his supervisor too. So none of the judges in that circuit were not, at one point, answering to you as their boss as a federal prosecutor. That's right. That did, that did happen. It was it was funny. And you were the criminal defense lawyer. Right. And so he was asking the prosecutor. So this is not abnormal for judges to have lawyers in front of them that used to supervise them. Right. Because as you can see here, she was an assistant state attorney in the 17th Judicial Circuit, which is now where she's a judge from 2001 to 2012. So she worked with a lot of the state attorneys that are still there. Well, and Mr. Satz uh, was the state attorney, I think, for 20 years. So there's almost no former assistant who's a judge that didn't work for Mr. Satz at some time. Exactly. So I, bet, I bet you half the bench. Working because state attorney, it's a natural flow for state attorneys, assistant state attorneys to become judges. So I guarantee you half the bench there probably worked for Mr. Sass. Right. And I, and that's fine. That does not make them biased. No, right. That does not does make not. them inherently biased. And that's the point. And that's what I really want to get across to people in, in this discussion. What we're trying to explain is there are some things that if you're a defendant in this process, you may think seems really unfair. Like this judge worked for this state attorney's office for 11 years, then became a judge. And, you know, now we're seeing how she's acting towards the criminal defense attorneys. We're seeing how she's acting towards the elected public official. And that's not a good look. We would rather it just be completely appearance of propriety at all times, being above reproach, not even allowing people to point out potential biases. It's not perfect. Right. Okay. Someone should be able to walk into that courtroom, sit in the back and not know that this judge has any preference for either side at any time, beginning or the end. That's the whole idea is to walk in that courtroom thinking that there is one person that is neutral in this because we have a prosecutor. We know what their side of the story is. We have a defense lawyer who performs the exact opposite side of the story. There's got to be a person in the middle that every citizen trusts when they walk into that courtroom. And Mo, we're answering that question right now, right? So her relationship with the former prosecutor, it isn't a conflict of interest unless they're married or, you know, they have some business venture together or something like that. But just the fact that she worked there, we work for state attorneys that we go up against right now and worked with them and they worked for my dad. And that's just how it's always going to work. Same thing with judges. Like judges are just lawyers in our community until they become judges. We've had cases with them. We've had cases against them. We like some, we don't like others. We're personal friends with some, we're not personal friends with others, but they are personal friends with some other lawyers. That does not make you recuse yourself. And then uh, Steelers, Eric Redblood, the U went down, F-L-O-R-I, I think you missed the I, D-A-S-T-A-T, -A -A Florida State, Florida State, Florida State. Woo, it was a big weekend for us against the U. But look where Judge Shearer went to undergrad, Florida State University. So she's obviously brilliant the Harvard of the South. I don't know why she went to University of Miami for law school, but 
it was probably a big weekend for her for football too. But if you look at, at, at her resume here or bio here, it's a great one for a judge. And and her dad's a lawyer too. Great. Yeah. I mean, she, she's probably very smart and level-headed, but she just made some, some, in my opinion, mistakes during this case. Like this is a great bio for someone who is a judge. And I, but I think the FACDL potentially has an argument that maybe, maybe she's not right for defense cases, or at least maybe some kind of a discussion should happen so that criminal defense lawyers who go in front of her in the future don't have to worry that the same treatment is going to, to come for them. You know, uh, right now in the system, about 90% of the cases are public defender cases. Mm -hmm. And so I guarantee you her docket is full of public defender cases. I guarantee you we're going to see a motion to recuse her from every public defender case because of her activity and what she did in this case to the elected public defender. You think that's going to happen for real? Oh, absolutely. If I was that public defender, I'd have my assistants file a motion in every single case to get her off the case. There's no way one of my clients is going to walk into that courtroom and feel like they're going to get a fair shake from this judge after the way the judge treated the elected public defender. What is the relationship between the public defender's office and FACDL? I know they have some involvement. Well, a, a, whole, a lot of assistant public defenders and public defenders are members. Uh, the public defenders have their own association as well, but they also belong to the FACDL because they understand that um, the benefits of FACDL membership as well as the public defender memberships, plus FACDL being a private organization not funded by state funds, uh, we can do things that the public defenders association cannot. Okay, so let's keep reading here the commentary. The integrity and independence of judges depend in turn upon their acting without fear or favor. Fear or favor. Although judges should be independent, they must comply with the law, including the provisions of this code. Public confidence in the impartiality of the judiciary is maintained by the adherence of each judge to this responsibility. Conversely, Violation of this code diminishes public confidence in the judiciary and thereby does injury to the system of government under the law. And part of what we're talking about when we say independence and we say what, you know, this judge potentially could have done differently. A lot of you sent me this video recently um, after, after the last video and said, is this normal? Um, should this have been done? What should we think about this? And this is the prosecution team. And there's another video from another angle that shows the defense team was kind of walking out as this was happening or after this happened. So these are the victims. And so as as we see her hugging the prosecution team here, dad, what what are your thoughts on this? I had you muted because you see the guy she just the guy she just hugged. Yeah, yeah, Joel. He's also I, I happen to know Sats and I happen to know Joel. Uh, he's also a senior supervisor, been there a long time on the state attorney's office that she mm-hmm. hugged. Um, so she has a long-standing relationship with them. But doing it in this fashion, um, although it might be it might be not a violation, it is something that really would make people wonder. You know, did she really favor the prosecution or not? You know, it's it's not really a good look. The optics are bad. So compare that, and I agree. And and here's the thing: there are plenty of judges that we hug when we see them at the Greek festival, or we see them at our kids' basketball games. It's high fives, it's hugs, it's whatever. But it's not in the courtroom right after the trial's over. Very in, in forty uh, something years, I've never had a judge not compliment one side and not the other. Exactly. And, yeah, they'll say both good job defense, good job prosecutors to be neutral when, when they're sitting up there. Or the civil judges, if they come down and it's, you know, first off, if it's hugs and like nobody's in the courtroom, that's one thing, but cameras and everybody in the courtroom is different. And um, we've had judges compliment and come down and, you know, say hi and talk to us afterwards and come down from the bench or take their robe off and just be in their normal clothes. That, that happens in some civil cases as well, but never has it been just one side and not the other. Now, compare and contrast that with the judge now hugging and talking to the victims. Any issue with that? 
No, actually, that is a more common uh, thing where, where they, they hug the victims after the case is over. Uh, I've seen that before. I've just never seen them just hug the prosecutors. That, that part just shows an imbalance. But yeah, I, I can see. I mean, let's face it, it, it. You know, she's not totally made of stone. Um, this case had to have an impact on her when she saw this and heard the victims. So, you know, she can maintain her neutrality. She saw the victims. She did a sentence hugging the victims. I, I can see her uh, doing that. And that really doesn't bother me as much as the prosecutors hugging. Yeah. And, and faith in the unseen, how much more can the families endure this? So all of this, none of this is going to cause an appeal. There's nothing better. Nicholas Cruz can get out of any of this. It's really just a discussion for lawyers that may go and especially public defenders and this public defender that may go before this judge in the future. Before I, uh, yeah, I, I just Chandler. don't know. I, I just, Mara Chandler, she was wrong. Also, a video was recorded and posted of her hugging the defense team after sentencing and the jury dismissed in the courtroom. I think she means the prosecution. Yeah, I didn't see any video of her hugging the defense team. Nicholas, in 30 years, I've been called to the central organization once, won the argument, and still had to endure a vote of confidence he stole for 40 years. Uh, Adam Ace, can you explain her ruling about his commissary? I didn't see this, did you? No. No. I didn't see the discussion about his commissary. I did see the the son of Sam law that he can't profit over um, right. about this. Uh, and some people were asking about that. So do you want to explain that, how a criminal defendant can't profit off of their um, conviction right. and they their murders? Can't write, a, can't write a book, can't uh, give paid lectures, can't do anything that would, uh, again, profit him on the lives of his victims. Scott, Nebraska, what do you think the state could have done differently to secure the death penalty? I don't think anything. Uh, well, I, I mean, like I said, we, we talked before about the closing argument. I think it could have been more uh, emotional, more showing of pictures, of, of you know, gruesome pictures, those kinds of things. She, she, she could have done that. But I, I've got a feeling that, that I think, do we know for sure it was 11 to 1? I don't, I don't know. No, it, I think sure. it, so the, 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 Foreman said it started out as 11 to one, but then I think two other people went to the, to the life side. So I think it ended up being nine to three, but it was 11 to one at some point. I think the real point is the only thing they could have done differently, in my opinion, is pick a better jury, um, flesh out better that this jury would pick death penalty. If it came down to it, I really in deep down, I believe that that one juror, that was the initial holdout that she probably, if they would have dug deeper, they would have found out that she actually has some moral um, something against the death penalty and would never pick the death penalty. That's just my thought. I could be wrong on that, but that, no, that's, I, I think, what the state could have done differently. It, it, it's, it's really logical because, I mean, whoever would have thought this wasn't going to be a death penalty case. I so. agree. If you have it, this seems like the case for it. Yeah. Mel Mitch, I didn't care for this judge at all. She seemed like she was super disrespectful, opposite of Daryl Brooks' judge. Daryl Brooks judge was one of the most patient judges I've ever seen in my life. Um, Anne Marie Mitchell, as a lawyer, can you object to a judge sitting on a case? If you know, they have a connection with one side, I think she was prosecution biased. So you want to explain how you can ask the disqualifier judge or you, ask them to you, recuse themselves. You, you can recuse a judge. There is a rule that allows you to do that. However, you have to have actual facts. You can't just say, gosh, I feel like they're not fair. You've actually got to be able to point to something like, they're married to one of the police officers that are going to testify. Mm -hmm. uh, or the, um, she has already said before the trial that she can't wait to sentence your client. Mm -hmm. You've got to actually point to something that is specific, having a feeling or a judge's rule against you all the time. So if the oh, fact yeah. that a judge rules against you on a motion, that's not a reason to recuse the judge. Judges rule against you all the time. So it is difficult to recuse the judge, but you've got to have specific facts. Uh, Jacqueline B said, what, uh, question, what if she apologizes? I think if she apologized and was like, you know what? Emotions got the better of me. I've known those prosecutors forever. The defense attorneys were frustrating in that trial, but that did not affect any of the rulings that I made or anything like that. Um, I apologize for summarily dismissing the, the sitting public defender that will not happen again. Um, I should have gone to sidebar and, you know, live and learn, but luckily it did not affect the case. I would say something like that if I was her. I, I think I personally would, as 
somebody who handles criminal defense cases in Florida, that would make me feel a lot better personally. What do you think? The problem, the problem you got is I don't know if she can do that because of the appeal. If, well, there's not going to be an appeal. He won. No, no, I don't know if she can do that ethically. I'd have to take a look at the rules because judges aren't supposed to comment on cases outside of the courtroom. And I don't know if those apologies are something she can actually do uh, outside of the courtroom. I mean, maybe she can call them back into court and have a hearing and apologize at the hearing. But as far as just making some comment to the press or issuing a press release, I don't think she can do that. Uh, time A, do you know this judge? Have you ever heard or have you ever been in her courtroom? Do you think she will be reprimanded? I, I don't know her. I've never been in her courtroom. Have you? I don't know her either, and I've never been in her courtroom. Do you think she'll be reprimanded at the end of the day? I don't. The, the I don't. Jay, this, the complaint's going to eventually, it's going to end up at the uh, Judicial Qualifications Commission. I think there is going to be a formal complaint eventually. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. Somebody probably needs to, she probably needs to go to judge's school uh, and to you know, relearn the part about decorum in the courtroom. But she probably will stay a judge. Yeah, Mara said, correction, I mistyped. She was talking to the attorneys at the DA's office. Yes, yes, we got you, Mara. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to transition here now and talk about some of the defense lawyers. Uh, Judy Grass, I do understand what you're saying about the judge's behavior. I still find it a bit much for the defense team to comment about behavior and dignity. We're going to get to that. Uh, Natalie Ball said, still think, Peter, that the defense was gaslighting the judge because she was new. A finger puff. Thanks, Peter. Uh, and then Syracuse Brad said, how often does the bird get flipped by counsel? So let's look at what you all are talking about here. So this is uh, obviously Nicholas Cruz, one of the assistant public defenders. They're literally pointing out where the cameras are. Joking around with him, which I can understand 100%. Yeah, waving to the cameras. I can understand why the victim's families were frustrated by this. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Everything the victim's family said, see, and there's the middle finger. As clear as you can say, she is doing the age old scratch your face and put up your middle finger that every kid did when they're 11 years old. Um, and they thought they were really funny. So what do you think about this? When you see something like this, what, what's your first thought? I am very disturbed by it. it. It hurts the entire profession. It takes away from the fact that you are there doing a job. The constitution mandates you to do. And instead what you're doing is you're being disrespectful. You're disrespectful to the system. The judge, no matter, again, what we think of her decorum and the way she acted, no judge deserves to be treated like this. And you've got to look at that judge as, you know, the, the robes, respect the robes, respect the judge's position. This is totally uncalled for. So I don't know if this was done while the judge was on the bench. I think this was before a pretrial started, and I don't think the trial was actively going on wow. at this point. Um, well, who, was, who was it aimed at? But horrible. I mean, this is the most embarrassing thing that came out of this trial for me. At least McLean, the blonde public defender that a lot of people hated, um, was frustrating with some of her arguments. But at least you could understand at points why she would couch it in zealous representation of her client. This, on the other hand, uh, Amanda H. is asking, what was the context? So she was, from what it's been told to me and what I've heard through like reporting, because obviously we don't know because she didn't say why she did this. But she saw all the cameras around. Nobody was really in the courtroom. It was before a pretrial hearing. And she was like joking around about how they should flick off the camera when the trial starts between her and Nick Cruz. That's what it's, that's what it's been reported to. Now, but you know, go ahead. I was just going to say whether that's true or not. I mean, obviously, I don't know. I wasn't there. But, but you know what's sad? The elected public defender was so respectful and came across. You couldn't criticize him, mm -hmm. including the chief assistant. You could not criticize the way they were acting. They were professional and doing their job. This ruins the everything they say because people are focusing on what uh, what happened here, and therefore it just it just hurt their argument about being we are professionals and we are using the proper decorum in the courtroom. The problem is that this happened throughout the trial. It was they were pretty 
miserable multiple times throughout the trial, which is why so many people stood up and said the judge was right. The judge was right to do what she did. But I think we compare that with the actual public defender in this case, Judge Darrow in, in her case, and the way some other judges have handled their case and that they have to be above all of this, regardless of how miserable the lawyers are being, because they're going to be miserable lawyers on both sides on a lot of cases. The judge has to be above it. And that may not seem fair. And I understand if you think that's not fair. And this, this, uh, let me just explain a little bit about what's going on with this um, lawyer here. So she is being investigated by the Florida Bar Grievance Committee. Uh, she is looking at potential reprimands. Um, she apologized because she said she didn't know uh, the cameras were on at that point, but she didn't actually, apo actually apologize to the victims or for anybody else. Um, let me see what else there is. Up well, how would the grievance committee handle something like this? You have video evidence that this happened in the courtroom. My guess is that if she's smart and if she has a, if she hires a lawyer that knows what they're doing, they're going to work out something with the grievance committee to uh, have her again, there there's courses and classes that they have to take for ethical behavior and decorum. Uh, she won't get disbarred or anything like that for this, but she's going to have to do something so that this kind of conduct doesn't repeat itself. Um, Cause again, this is deplorable. I, I'm and very I mean, unhappy what, seeing this. Whatever she gets, she deserves for yes. this because you've lost it at this point. You've lost something. You're, you're lost along the way. If you, if you can find yourself doing this in court, like I just, I can't imagine in the middle of trial, all the stress prepping for witnesses, prepping for arguments. And this is what you're doing before a pretrial starts. And this maybe shows think, me they had too many lawyers at the table. because She didn't have enough to do. Don't you think that every judge in that circuit has seen this? And every time this lawyer appears before that judge, they're not going to forget that she did this. Exactly. Uh, Albanian Anissa said, guys, the camera flip was supposedly from all the controversy from the day before it was aimed to the media. And I believe it was court TV in there, but the court was not in session and the judge was not there. Yeah. This is along the same lines as, as what I heard. So what, what does a grievance committee do? Um, what is the grievance committee? I guess we should start with who's it made up of and what do they do when something like this is presented to them? I know you told us what you think she should do, but what does the actual grievance committee do? Well, the, the bar doesn't even have to get a complaint. The bar can see this video sure. and file a complaint themselves. And that's important. Uh, they, Sorry to interrupt right. you. That's if people are always like, don't interrupt your dad. There's a lot we want to get out. And I want to make sure you answer so these questions. So, so that's a really important thing in Florida and our ethics. It's almost like golf, right? The Florida bar and us lawyers here, it's almost like golf. We are supposed to call ourselves on problems. If you see it, you're obligated to report it. You can't make a judgment call. Like if I see a lawyer, it's a friend of mine stealing money. I have to report it or I could be in violation of the rules, right? So if other lawyers see this or the grievance committee people see this, they're almost obligated to go out and make sure this behavior doesn't continue, right? Right. And so there'll be a grievance filed. Then a, a an attorney for the bar will make a decision whether it goes to a committee made up of lawyers and civilians, which is the grievance committee. The grievance committee hears it, makes a decision whether there's probable cause or not. If there is probable cause, then it goes to a, a master that actually, a hearing officer that actually has a formal hearing and then recommends disbarment or suspension, something like that. It goes to the Board of Governors of the Florida Bar that then eventually votes on it and makes a decision. However, she can make a deal beforehand, for instance, for a letter of reprimand plus uh, 30 hours, additional hours of professional training, uh, those kinds of things, which I think will probably happen in this case. But it can it can go all the way to you have to retake the bar. You've got to reapply to the bar. I mean, they can, it can go further. I don't know if that's really what will happen here. Mo said yeah. if she is in trouble for this, the other lawyer also needs to be reprimanded because the one next to her did it too. Okay, this is the only clip that was sent to me. Um, uh, Tor Theo, what's the point of the complaint? NC can't get any better. I think we've explained this, like what, why the process is so important the independence of the judiciary, why that's so important. We, we explained kind of earlier on John O'Rourke. Can the JEAC be able to go look at Shear's prior cases and find holes with her acting inappropriately? If so, could anything happen moving forward? Yes. Yeah. The, the JQC, yeah, the JQC can do that. Uh, they can look at a whole series of cases to see if there's a pattern and they can make a decision based on a pattern of conduct. 
Rich Cat Ranch, does it help her that the trial was over at that point? Now, it would help her in like the appeals. If this was going to be an appeal, the fact that the jury wasn't there would be important, but not for the criminal defense bar and the public defender's office and the way the JQC is going to look at it. You can't do this stuff in open court with the cameras there. Now, again, all of you in this channel and me included, we like having cameras in the courtroom, being able to watch these trials. But when things like this happen and extra scrutinies on every judge and every lawyer in every courtroom, it's going to make them less likely to want to allow these public cameras in there to stream it on YouTube. Do you agree with that, Dad? Well, yes. Well, remember, I think we, we had a discussion about appeals. And now that now that we have all this video of a trial, will the court look at the video? And we said, no, they'll, they'll look at the paper transcript. They're not going to look at the video and determine what happened on the appeal. However, I think that this video, if you read the paper transcript of her exchange with the public defender or the or chief assistant public defender, it will look vastly different on paper than if you actually watch the video. And that's the miracle of today's modern social media is this is really going to show what happened. And that the JQC, whoever looks at this, the ethics uh, uh, department of the bar, they're going to see a video and they're going to watch that video and see what it was like. Uh Mo, here in the abundance of fairness, you are you all are correct, as I should know by now, because you guys know this stuff so well. This is the other lawyer doing it. It was a little bit of a quicker flip, but yeah, both of these uh, lawyers did it. So you know, and the, the a lot of the press missed that because I was reading a lot of clippings and they only talked about the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lex mm -hmm. Leather or Lux Leather said the same thing. John O'Rourke, this complaint needed to happen to uphold judges' code of conduct. Uh, state slash nationwide. If she gets moved to a different court, does that look terrible for her career? Who looks further into it for larger punishment? Thanks, Papa T. Um, what do you think? Do you think this really looks terrible for her career if she gets moved? No, I don't. I, I I don't think so. I don't think if she gets moved any next election and around, it's not going to make any difference. And and what it, I mean, again? Let's let's face it. What is she going to say? Oh, was I too rough? on those guys on the and child the, murderer. Yeah. Right. I, was I honestly, too rough? <laughs> I, if she just somebody like my dad handles, or actually my dad's over here handles most of our criminal defense stuff. <laughs> I'm almost all doing civil stuff. Like I don't even have a criminal case right now that I'm handling. I would not think this judge here was 1% biased. If she were to come to the civil world, if she were to sit on all my trials, it'd be perfectly fine with me because I'm not representing child murderers and people that she would, you know, really despise there's no state attorney that she used to work with. Actually, it's not even true, right? She could, I could work with some of the judges. I did work with some of the judges at the state attorney's office that are civil court judges. They've worked with my counterparts. counterparts. So that still happens even in the civil world, just as much as it does in the criminal world. The point is though, if you do have some sort of bias that makes you not be able to control yourself when you really despise a monster, which we all understand and we agree with, and we can understand why she feels that way. We're not robots, right? But some people are better built for different positions. And I don't think that, my dad's much better built to be a criminal defense lawyer than I am. I mean, that that's that's okay. That's facts of life, right? I think we can all understand that in our life. Doesn't make her bad or inept or anything like that. Joe Gottman, have either of you ever had to write a complaint on a judge or opposing side? No, I have never filed it. I have never filed a complaint. I have never filed a complaint. I'm trying to see if we've ever filed something to recuse a judge. Oh, I've done that. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've filed to recuse judges. Uh, but I've never filed a, a complaint with the JQC. I can only remember one time and we won. I think the judge agreed and recused himself on the only case I can think of personally. And it was no like shots taken at that. I have seen lawyers take shots at judges in motions to recuse and it doesn't go well for them usually. Azam is joining the rewatch crew. So we'll check you later. Anita Carroll. The difference is when victims said that to the prosecutors, how many people were at the desk? It wasn't to one person specifically. I'm with the judge. That's fair. And that's fine to be with the judge. I understand that. We're just bringing it from a perspective of the criminal defense bar here and how they're looking at it. And we'll see if the JQC sees anything in it. Uh, Gretchen, the devil, she cut him from all his money. Can't even buy a soap from now on. This is way out of line. Even for him, this was not just the son of Sam law. Okay, so I did read something that she is she ordered him to pay all restitution out of his commissary until he pays it all off, which my guess is is never. Have you ever seen that happen before? No, because um, I've seen them say a percentage of your commissary money. 
but I've never seen it. And, and if she did that, my guess is the appellate court is going to change that because they won't tell someone they can't buy anything in commissary while they're in prison. That, that's really pretty, uh, uh, that's pretty, you can't buy a bar of soap while you're in prison. I mean, like I said, it, it, that's going to be reversed if she did say that. Mel Mitch, your dad is completely right. All sides need to act professionally and uphold the decorum of the court. The judge should appear absolutely neutral. Agreed. John O'Rourke, great discussion today from the Tragoses. We have said it once and let's say it again. Best, friendliest, smartest chat in the YouTube game. Thanks all. And I, of course, second that. Christopher Bust, why does it take over four years and millions of dollars to send someone to prison that murdered 17 people? And is it really the job of a public lawyer to paint a picture of doubt every time? All right. Second part. Yes. If you're a public defender and you're going to trial, it's your job to raise reasonable doubts. That's what we call. If they that's exist. What we call the picture. And in this case, right. they weren't raising reasonable doubts. Right. They but were saying that trial, life. They were saying I'm that sorry. life is the more appropriate sentence, not death. They weren't raising reasonable doubts as to whether or not he murdered anybody. So just wanted right. to clarify that. Sorry. Right. And, and I stand correct. But in, in a trial, a general trial, that is a lawyer's job. Uh, four years. Think about it. You've got 17 victims. Think how many witnesses there were. How long did the trial last, Peter? How long trial Months, last? but they took breaks. Yeah. I, you, got I, a de- you know, you got depositions of who knows. But they probably deposed 100 witnesses or more. No, I, I don't think, think so. Just for you the penalty phase? No, no, no. Before they pled guilty, I bet you they did I'm discovery. Not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, because, I mean, you would be remiss if you pled somebody guilty to murder without having done the discovery. You think about it. Okay. Um, Mo said she garnished it. I don't think it's all his money. So a percentage would make more sense. It sounds like you're saying, right. Dad. I yeah. don't know. I have I haven't dealt with a lot of these a lot of yeah, I can, cases. I can like see her doing people. taking a percentage. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of people, the comments were like, you would never understand because you haven't been a judge in a murder case before. It's like, it's right. That is correct. I've never been a judge in a murder case before, but you don't need to be a judge in a murder case to understand how the judiciary is supposed to act as a lawyer, as a prosecutor, as a public defender. And that's the point, is we all do have to work together. And actually, what's interesting is the 17th circuit where she is when I was on their webpage today, looking for her bio, there are two judges that are on the civil rules committee with me that are awesome and incredibly smart and donate tons of their time. It's a big circuit. It's an important circuit. This is not middle of nowhere, Florida. This is important. And and I think that's, that's why a lot of the attention is coming as well. Uh, Jesse Lopez. I loved having Trago Sr. on for the discussion today. He seems like a wonderful lawyer, dad, and man. Greetings. Such a rich conversation. I can't tell what that flag is. It's too small. Is it Italy? You know, Peter, you're saying before, but you know what? We have been judges in mood court competitions. (laughs) Yeah, but I don't think that, I don't think that's really the same. (laughs) And we've also handled murder cases and attempted murder cases in federal court. Like, listen, there are, there are big cases. We've handled plenty of big cases. The how she should act really shouldn't change whether it's this case or whether it's a DUI. Right. She should not act inappropriately towards the criminal defense lawyer, regardless of the case. Azam's getting some sleep. She's earned it. Lynn, this is the best channel on YouTube. Thank you, Lynn. Hopefully you guys have subscribed. Hopefully all 4,000. That's a lot for, for this topic. Uh, hopefully you guys all hit the like button. We're coming up on an hour here, so we've got a little bit more time to finish off the rest of these questions. Peter and George, I'm at uni of Oxford. This is from Enroth and was wondering, would you ever be interested in taking part in a law debate at the Oxford union? I would love to see this in a heartbeat. <laughs> send me a ticket. Sure. Yeah. Send us, send us an email, send us an email. Lawyer, you know, at gmail.com bark and mad. I have mixed feelings about this. I agree. Bark and mad. And so do I, I have mixed feelings about how I should feel in humanity and empathy and sympathy, but I know how a judge should act on the bench during trial and sentencing that, that I'm very clear on. I keep coming back to one thing. McNeil chose to bring up her own kids during the trial. Isn't that topic fair game then just like a witness opening a door. I think that everybody needs to understand everybody in that courtroom had a function. Uh, The prosecution had a function. The defense had a function. The judge had a function. If anything is out of control, if someone says something inappropriate, 
or whatever it is, it is the judge's responsibility to make control, maintain control in that courtroom. So if that defense lawyer did something wrong, that judge was supposed to take care of it, just like if the prosecutor did something wrong. So you can't blame a defense lawyer if she lets the defense lawyer get away with a comment. That was the judge's job to cut the defense lawyer off if that was an improper comment. And the judge said they should have that the defense lawyers should have objected to it, which I don't think is an unfair comment. If they had a problem with it, they could object to it. But everybody would have hated on them for objecting during the victim impact statement as well. I actually think they did the right thing. Waited till the statements were done, brought it up to the judge, tried to do it at sidebar and say, judge, just can we make sure that this does not continue or get even worse? They they did plenty wrong throughout the trial. But the way they handled that specifically, I, I thought was OK. Uh, uh, Jessel Lopez said, I'm from Guadalajara, Mexico. Awesome. I missed that one. Um, enjoy every minute said no. She said all his commissary. Okay. Well, we'll see if they appeal that portion. John, what about the victim stating Cruz is going to be someone's B in prison? It seemed like the victims meant the R word. Is that appropriate to state? What do you think? It doesn't bother me one bit. I think they can say whatever they want. To I, I, think, they that's a big, I, I think victims have free reign if they stay within certain parameters. And in that one, I think that a victim, they want to say that they can say it. That's fine by me. You can, everybody's saying it anyways, and everybody's thinking it. And that's something that gives them a little solace that he didn't get the death penalty is maybe it'll be worse in prison for them. To me, that's fair game, but they shouldn't say that the defense lawyer is going to be somebody's B and get that or karma's getting right. them the way that it's going to get Nicholas Cruz. That that's kind of, where I think the judge should have tempered it. I don't blame the victims for saying it and being angry at everybody over there. I don't blame them one bit. They have every right to be, and they can say it in the press all they want. Joe, Papa T, why did you choose to be a defense attorney? Um, when I got out of law school, the best job was an assistant state prosecutor, a state attorney in Pinellas County, so I could come home to Clearwater. And uh, I enjoyed it so much, I didn't look back. Camila, this is the only channel I have a paid membership for on YouTube. Well, Camila, awesome. Welcome yeah. to the crew here, too. Glad to have you. Syracuse Brad, is jury selection, Vordire, a specialization for attorneys? I think it's a critical skill with huge impacts on cases. So it's not necessarily a special. Usually you have a lawyer in your firm that does it um, for the most part and focuses on it and tries to hone in on it. I know it's something that I like doing a lot. It's a discussion with the jury. I also talk about all the time how this YouTube channel has helped me with that and made me better and more understanding about when people answer certain ways, what they might think, what their background is, um, what they kind of bring to the table and how they would understand the process and whether or not they could be fair and impartial. I, I do it on all of the civil cases I'm on. I know you do it on all of our criminal cases. Um, I think it's something that experience helps with. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, but there actually are some people that, will go around and pick juries for different trials for different firms. And then of course there are jury selection experts you can bring in like a jury consultant, but they're not the ones actually doing the, the voir dire. I, I've, I've got to agree with you that I have really benefited a lot from watching your YouTube and how people respond to questions and uh, for jury selection. It really has helped hearing the people, you know, your people. Yeah, I agree. Cause like, it's a nice cross section. I mean, even if it's, yeah. it's worldwide, it's not just Florida or not just in our County or circuit or jurisdiction, but it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, I also think it's good to see how, how you present something, even if somebody might have a automatic disagreement with it, they could understand if, if you explain it the right way. So I think that's, that's pretty interesting as well. Um, there was one other thing. Oh, so I was not planning on doing this. You guys showed up for this discussion you control the content on the channel. You always control the content on the channel. You may not control my arguments or how I see the content that you uh, bring to the table, but please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Tragos Law right here. Find us on all social media and let us know what you want to talk about. I'm not going to hit a trial this week. I'm going to be tying up some loose ends. We may be commenting some more on the Sarah Boone trial or some of the other cases, but it was actually a funny discussion on, on Twitter. I was like, what case is starting next Monday? And I said it on Sunday or Saturday. So people, some people thought today was next Monday. Other people thought how, what I was thinking, which was next week would be next Monday. So that was kind of a funny social experiment. But let me know. Um, let me know what content is coming up. 
and what trials you want to focus on. And I will look into them and we will try to break them down here on this channel. Um, and we'll try to start a trial that starts that next Monday and talk about some other things in between, but you guys control it. So get on the YouTube community page, get on social media, get in the chat here. Let me know, comment. And in this live chat now, put what case you want us to break down next. And if it has some criminal aspects that I can get my dad in on, he will be here to discuss it as well. Um, Mo is asking, did you see Johnny Depp meeting Andy from Popcorn Planet? Pretty cool. Yes, I did see that. That is really cool. I mean, people dedicated a lot of time and energy to supporting him. So I think it's really nice that he does recognize that um, and repays it with kindness. Passive observer. It is so dangerous to allow criminal defense lawyers and jurors to be attacked on a personal level for simply doing their jobs or duty. We didn't even talk about it happening to the jury, jury but that is completely off limits. Like that should be stopped in its tracks immediately if anybody condemns the jury for their decision or acts like they didn't do it for the right reason or the right um, uh, whatever, like they went outside the process. And you can accuse me of doing that because I said, I think the only thing the state could have done better is pick the jury that was going to vote for the death penalty. But what I mean by that is I think this jury was kind of always going to go that way. So, but I agree. Thanks for bringing that up. Steve-O's channel. The chief public defender said in front of the victims of this tragedy that nobody has had to endure what we have had to. I think I agree with you. He did say that. I think that was a, a miss. I think he messed up his words. I disagree with him there. The families have had to endure yeah. much worse. He, yeah, he shouldn't have said that. But we all say things we shouldn't have said. Yeah. And, and I would say and we're not dismissing that he said that. I think what yeah. he meant is. They are it is their jobs in this, right? They are not the victims and they are not the defendants. So to be treated as either is is wrong, but I agree with you. That was not not a good look. Should not have said it. I think if he would go back, he would absolutely not say that again. Mara Chandler. So we've got to sign off here in a, in a minute or two. So I'm just going to get a couple more. Mr. T, how did you feel when your son first said he wanted to go into the law profession? Did you ever tell them you wanted to be a doctor? Probably at some point. Yeah, he wanted to be a doctor, but then he realized how much he enjoyed arguing. And uh, he, he, he became a lawyer and I was, I was very happy. I really was. In fact, I had to fight to get him to come to the firm. He was, he was actually got an offer from another firm and I had to outbid the other firm to get him to come here. Nicholas, sorry, you mentioned Girardi and that case is P P me. Oh man, me too. We are definitely going to follow that case. That's one. I will be honest with you. That's going to be hard for me to be unbiased about. Because I know what personal injury lawyers, the control they have over the cases, and when people take advantage of that and the trust their clients have and steal millions of dollars from burn victims from plane crashes and people that got poisoned, it's a hard one for like like this judge. I would maybe recuse myself if I was a judge on that case. Uh, Southern Mama. Hi, Logan is sporting a boot cast. You'll you'll push through, Logan. Uh, he's doing good. Your shout out and so many messages from the chat family made it way better. Thanks going to build character, Logan. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. I was in a cast for a long time when I was in high school. All right. That's it. You guys are the best. Thanks for joining us, dad. Thanks for joining us today on the show. It Love doing fun. it. Always appreciate your insight. Nobody, I always tell people as well, nobody could have the career he has because if you get to be the chief assistant U S attorney, um, you usually keep that job. So, but he left it to go out on his own Papa T. So no family discount. Definitely not anymore. That's for sure. No, no family discounts on any sides. All right. Thank you, Tammy and everybody for joining us, but we're out of here until next time. Yes. Like, and subscribe on your way out. See ya.